This is Ray Miles Oldard with an article from the December 21st, 2021 edition of the Epic Times newspaper. The article was written by Jeff Minnick and is titled Battling Hard Times, Some Help from the Founders. That these words have recently popped up in some online articles. Hard times make strong men. Strong men make good times. Good times make weak men. Weak men make hard times. Let's assume, just for argument's sake, that we're in hard times right now. Making a case for that assertion is relatively easy. We're still dealing with the pandemic after almost two years of lockdowns, masks, and diminished liberties. We're facing rocketing costs at the supermarkets and gas pumps. Our federal government is spending money like some crazy uncle who just won the lottery. And our traditional culture appears besieged everywhere. Every day seems to bring more bad news. And the swirl of headlines leaves most of us breathless and dizzy. Like some kid who, who was just spent a few too many moments spinning around in the backyard. Next, let's suppose again, just for the sake of argument, that we live in hard times because of many of our leaders and even many of their followers are weak men and women. If the four statements that I began with are true, then that should take us back to the first line of the equation. Hard times make strong men. The statement behind that line is great. But where are we able to find examples of such strong people? Perhaps our tough circumstances will produce such leaders, but wouldn't it really help if each of us possessed some examples of strength to guide us? The Romans looked to their ancestors for guidance. The Knights of the Middle Ages relied on ballads and tales of such heroes as King Arthur and Roland to stiffen their hearts and will. Where do we find exemplars who have the power to fire up our willpower and our resolve? We might take some lessons from the heroes of our American Revolution. The birth and establishment of our Republic may seem may inevitable to us today. <clears throat> but that was hardly the case at the time. The men and women who fought by sword or by pen for freedom were, as they well knew, subject to imprisonment, poverty, and even execution if they lost their struggle for liberty. The men who would sign the Declaration of Independence, for example, patriots such as Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Hancock, understood they were signing their death warrants if the forces of the British Empire defeated them. Not only might England hang them as traitors, but the livelihoods and well-being of their families would also be jeopardized. 
seeking their rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness came with the real possibility of utter ruin. And one man who had the most to lose, at least financially, was George Washington. Gravitas means dignity, seriousness, or solemnity in manner. And George Washington had gravitas in spades. Washington was the most intellectual of the American founders. Unlike Jefferson or Madison, Washington never attended college. He never became proficient in Latin or Greek, and he mourned his defective education for his entire life. He taught himself whatever he learned and turned to surveying and military service after his adolescence. Later, he became one of the wealthiest men of his time. Despite his lack of higher education, Washington understood the vital importance of high moral integrity and self-discipline in the public square. Early in life, he composed his own, quote, rules of civility and decent behavior, which was essentially an outline of manners and correct behavior. At six feet five, he took pride in how he dressed and he carried himself with dignity, impressing his contemporaries by his respectable behavior. Though lacking the educational advantages of his older half-brothers, he taught himself the value of ethical integrity. He had a command of himself that strengthened the command in others. He knew that to conduct oneself with such dignity is a mark of strength. Like George Washington, Henry Knox of Boston was more than six feet tall, which was an impressive height in his era. And Knox weighed 250 pounds. At age nine, he left school to work in a bookshop where the proprietor treated him like a son and allowed him to borrow books for reading and study. Knox eventually opened his own bookshop, which was popular with the British officers and officials in the city and from his conversations with them, from his reading, and from his participation in an artillery militia, became well-versed in the arts of war. As soon as the revolution began, Knox and his wife Lucy fled the city, leaving his bookshop to be sacked by loyalists. Impressed by Knox's artillery fortifications above Boston, Washington approved the young man's plan for bringing the cannon and mortars captured from the British at Fort Ticonderoga in New York to Boston. Knox directed wagons, oxen, and hundreds of men 300 miles and eventually returned to Boston with the artillery pieces which were then used to drive the British troops and ships from Boston. It was one of the greatest feats of the American Revolution. Lessons learned from Henry Knox were vision and determination keys for human strength. 
Dr. Joseph Warren, the general who died as a foot soldier at Bunker Hill, Nathan Hale, who bravely faced his ex execution as a spy, the wily swamp fox, Francis Martian, Mad Anthony Wayne, these and so many others were strong men in hard times. They bled and died and fought and won their freedom. Here we take as one example, neither a warrior nor a politician, but a mother and a wife, Abigail Adams, wife of John Adams, a founding father who later became the second president of the United States. Abigail was an early advocate for education and an early advocate for rights for women and an abolitionist. With her husband away for months at a time, handling various duties, Abigail raised her children, sought their education, and managed the family farm. She wasn't afraid to express her opinion, writing to John when he was attending the First Continental Congress, telling him to remember the ladies and bring them in to the discussions, and corresponding with Thomas Jefferson. To the end of John Adams' life, Abigail remained his closest advisor. Abigail Adams is emblematic of all the women who were forced to manage farms, businesses, and families, while their husbands and fathers were away fighting the, the war. Grit and self-sufficiency are what we can learn from these women. Compared to the trials of our spiritual ancestors, our own troubles seem mild. So far, we're not called to choose between Patrick Henry's give me liberty or give me death. The 21st century has brought an erosion of our liberties, but even today some health professionals have reached their positions only to face professional condemnation for speaking up for personal freedom and choice during the pandemic. Parents appear before school boards seeking answers as to what their children are being taught and why they must wear masks in the classroom and are attacked by authorities. Some business owners have bucked against government mandates and regulations and have suffered the consequences. Those old words of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness still abide in many American hearts. And if at times we feel in need of inspiration or the temptation to give away to despair, we can revisit those who preceded us in the great experiment that is our republic and take strength from their deeds and their wisdom. That beautiful article was written by Jeff Minnick, who has four children and a, a growing platoon of grandchildren. For 20 years, he taught history, literature, and Latin to seminars of homeschooling students in Asheville, North Carolina. He's the author of two novels, Amanda Bell and Dust on Their Wings. I'd love to read both books because he is such a great writer. 
Today he lives and writes in Front Royal, Virginia. If you'd like to follow his blog, simply go to Jeff Minnick, M-I-N-I-C-K dot com. Jeff Minnick, M-I-N-I-C-K dot com. Jeff Minnick, M-I-N-I-C-K dot com. I am so pleased to have shared this with you. And while I've been doing it, and even before, I've come to realize how terribly important it is to teach your children to read and read the right kind of stuff. Children's books are great. I mine was Uncle Wiggly and Wind in the Willows and so many others. But yours may be in this generation, something else is cleverly written and wonderful to share. Read to them at first and then get them to start reading. That's what happened to me. My mom would read, my dad would read, then they began to teach me to read. And I, in spite of them reading beautifully, I wanted to add the voices and to put each character into a position so that I would cast the book as I went along with different people that I knew my friends and even adults and some movie stars. But I enjoyed that so much. And that's what brought me to the place of being able to read audio books. I tell you, I enjoy every one of them. So teach your children to read. You'll be glad you did. And so will they.